Charleston was called by the great evangelist George Whitfield to be the place of his greatest opposition, but also of his greatest success. John and Charles Wesley, too, were compelled to proclaim the Lord in the heart of this city at St. Philip's. And one of the 20th century's most powerful preachers, Dr. Robert G. Lee, was led by the Spirit to also sow in the Charleston area as he pastored at Siddle Square Baptist. Over the last 150 years within Charleston's collective Christian community, there have been growing whispers of a coming revival, a revival that would change everything. Today, you can look around and see there are more Charleston congregations of every background who are sounding the alarm to pray. And if one looks at the history of Charleston, it's easy to see why hope abounds. Consider the year of 1857, just a few years before the Civil War. A divine advent occurred at Anson Street Presbyterian Church when a handful of black and white believers were called to seek God. They were called to seek God by their white pastor, John Gerardo. Before the Civil War, it was commonplace for blacks and whites, because of the yoke of slavery, to attend services together. That summer, the preaching services were put on hold and they began a prayer meeting, petitioning God to send a spiritual awakening while waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. For months, they intensely and patiently sought the Lord. And then one evening, it happened. While quiet in prayer, what felt like a surge of electricity struck Gerardo's head and filled his entire being. Before he had called the prayer meeting, Gerardo had preconceived within his own mind what God's eventual visit would be like. He would then simply dismiss the prayer meeting and resume preaching the following night. But something greater was happening, something beyond him, and this would not be dismissed. Gerardo first heard, then looked up to observe the trembling and the tears of his brethren. The Holy Spirit had come upon the entire congregation. And there they were, 48 black Christians, 12 white Christians, 60 in all, with everyone weeping, worshiping, and praying for the souls of lost neighbors and loved ones. As they serenaded their heart's love, he filled them to overflowing. When God came to the corner of Anson and Calhoun, a powerful chain reaction occurred. For the next eight weeks, the Lord visited Charleston as thousands from across the city from every background were saved. Congregations from every background grew. The spiritual atmosphere over Charleston was altered, and a window for revival had been opened to an entire nation. Revival historian Edwin Orr cites the great impact of this event, which preceded another very important event in New York City. The spiritual ripple effect of God's move in Charleston eventually reached New York, where layperson and businessman Jeremiah Lamphere gathered six men to pray at the old North Dutch Church on Fulton Street. From that moment, the explosive 1858 awakening hit the entire East Coast of the United States with over one million people being reborn within one year's time. The Lord's manifest presence swept from New York all the way down into the Deep South. For example, the Baptist Church of Buford received over 400 new Christians into fellowship within only three days. Inevitably, the political arena was impacted. Overnight, the abolitionist movement took off, and political tensions over states' rights erupted. Beneath that surface issue was the true heart of the tension, the value of a person. Those 48 black slaves, unknown to the rest of the world, were seeking liberty himself, and he would come with his sword of truth, dividing and discerning heart's motives, and setting neighbor against neighbor. Slavery's evil was exposed in mass as millions were convicted by the spirit. Civil War. Nearly 700,000 men would lose their lives. Contrary to popular opinion, the first real shot of the Civil War was not fired at Fort Sumter. But within a praying congregation of black and white Christians, Christians who were seeking the Lord and not a political remedy. That shot came just a few blocks away from the very harbor Fort Sumter guarded. That shot came from the Lord himself. Shortly after the war, the Anton Street Presbyterian Church was nearly burned completely to the ground by arsonists, but the rear portion remained, which was later integrated into a newer building. Today, the predominantly black congregation of St. John's Reformed Episcopal resides there, located directly across the street from the Gelliard Municipal Auditorium. Tourists can see at the rear of the building the original bricks and mortar that once housed those who sought the Lord so intensely. In April 1859, the black slaves of Anson Street Presbyterian moved into a new building at the intersection of Meeting and Calhoun Streets. They renamed their congregation Zion. 
Zion Presbyterian became famous for Gerardo's preaching. He was called the Spurgeon of America. The influence of Zion was so great within Charleston that Gerardo and its leadership were often criticized and even at times physically threatened for that influence. For example, the training and teaching of hymns and psalms was so effective that some believe Gerardo was teaching the slaves to read, which of course was contrary to state law. And most historians agree that's exactly what was happening. Today, the congregation that was known as Zion Presbyterian is now called Zion Olivet Presbyterian Church, now located at 134 Cannon Street, downtown Charleston. Following his service as a Civil War chaplain, Gerardo was invited by Zion to return to resume his work as their trusted friend and pastor. His color, not an issue. The deep love of Christ in them for him was... Gerardo worked within the black and white communities during the post-war and reconstruction years. He often broke ranks with the establishment and even laid hands upon his black brethren for ordination into ministry. But the hardened positions of other white church leaders across the South in every denomination brought the church world to a pivotal moment. Alone in his descent, Gerardo could not prevent his own denomination like the rest from segregating black and white Christians from each other into separate congregations. The spirit who had visited Anson Street had now been ignored and forgotten. The heart of God grieved. But history serves as a witness as well as the voice of the one who spoke not very long ago at the corner of Anson and Calhoun Streets. For he is still speaking today. Return to me together. And what I do will be beyond your wildest imagination. For I am the Lord the healer of the hearts of Charleston.